This morning I felt strongly that the Lord wanted me to share this very specific message. This is an age-old message. I've shared it quite a few times. But it's actually one of my favorite because it comes from my own personal experience in life. One of the biggest... <clears throat> in fact, uh, my children were telling me the other day, you know that what we go through you guys have never gone through which each generation <laughs> things are different and I said to them well you haven't gone through what we have gone through <laughs> Amen every generation has its own issues <clears throat> one of the issues that humanity faces around the world and I'll tell you that this is the root cause of many 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 issues is the issue of loneliness. Loneliness is a terrible thing. It's also a spirit. If you, if you neglect it, a spirit comes. But God has a plan for you. Amen. Amen. To take away your loneliness. I'll begin by, by sharing a scripture on the screen. Psalms 68 and verse 6. Because I want you to take this scripture home with you I want you to meditate upon it I want you to write it down because for me this scripture has helped me in the last 25 years Psalms 68 and verse 6 and God says God sets the lonely in families Amen I'm only focusing on the first few words God sets the lonely in families Church as the spirit of loneliness has hit the entire earth God is saying you don't need to be lonely because I'm going to set you in a family I remember in the 90s I went through a time of loneliness I tell you lots of people around me but I felt an emptiness and a loneliness that I cannot even to this day describe are you hearing what I'm saying I couldn't tell anybody I don't think anybody would have understood because we judge loneliness by the number of people that are around us or not. There are people with nobody around them and they're not lonely at all. They love their own company. But here I am. I was a little bit in the ministry. This was the early 90s or, or, or the mid 90s. And I went into a depression. My goodness, for about three days. I couldn't get up off my bed. I felt somebody was sitting on my chest. And then God came and began to deliver me, not all at once, but little by little by little. Church, you have hope. Amen. Loneliness is not something you need to deal with, contend with. God dealt with it on the cross. In Jesus' name. Amen. When he's in uh, 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 the Mount of Olives, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus felt lonely. So he goes to the disciples and says, Can't you wait with me one hour? His loneliness in that moment set us free. Gave us the opportunity or gave him the opportunity of taking away our loneliness. As we face the pressures of life every single day, Different people, different generations, different pressures. If you're lonely, your pressures become a thousand times worse. Isn't that right? But if you have somebody close to you who will stand by your side, your pressures <laughs> reduce. Amen. Why? Because sometimes we, we can't face our problems alone. Now, I've been a preacher for 25 years. But do you know that even today, I can't face some things on my own. I need people. Amen. God never intended for us to be on our own. He wanted us to be part of a body, part of a spiritual family, part of a natural family. And I praise God. I am surrounded by people, different, different types of people. 
So I'm going to share with you a story about two very unlikely people in the Bible that God placed. I want to share with you how God placed them and what happened to this amazing alliance. And this story is a story of David and Jonathan. Now David, as you know, as you may know, was the son of a shepherd boy. I mean, he was a nobody. Nobody knew Jonathan, uh, uh, David. Nobody knew his father, Jesse. I mean, they were just shepherds. And then his brothers were in the, in the Israelite army. They were faced with Goliath. David goes to the camp, taking some bread and some cheese and some things from, the, from his father. And he says to his brothers, he says to the people in the camp, who dares to defy the armies of Israel, the armies of God? And then they said, Goliath, oh, I, I'm now digressing. I like, I like David. He said, what's in it for me if I kill Goliath? Amen. And they said, oh, two things. You'll never have to pay taxes and you get the king's daughter. And David said, Amen. Amen. So, and then the Bible says, he, he sees Goliath and he runs to the battlefield. What was in his mind? The, marrying the king's daughter and never having to pay taxes. Hallelujah. So anyway, you know the story. He killed Goliath and then he reports back to uh, uh, the palace of, of King Saul. And while he is in that in his presence, King Saul says, who in the world are you? I've never seen you. I've never heard about you. He says, I'm the son of Jesse. And I can just see King Saul saying, now who in the world is Jesse? No, I mean, he is a nobody. In, that, in the presence of that throne room is another man called Jonathan. He was the heir to the throne, the next king of Israel, the, the son of, of King Saul, of, of, of of Saul and then the Bible tells us that God did something miraculous while David was speaking the heart of Jonathan was knit together with the heart of David church there is a knitting together of hearts only God can do it he is the author of it two unlikely people David who's an absolute nobody the family were nobodies and in that family David was a nobody because he said my in the book of Psalms he said my mother and father they rejected me and here is the prince of Israel Jonathan but their hearts were knitted together in a way that was unbreakable in a way that their lives would be so changed through this alliance but the beauty of it is their social <laughs> standing never mattered in the knitting of these hearts. Their financial <laughs> situation did not matter. Their family situation did not matter. Their destinies did, did not matter. Nothing mattered. They could not understand why they began to love each other with the love of God. The problem we have in Asian countries especially is that we find it difficult to form relationships with people who don't speak the same language as us. Who don't know how to use fork and spoon, a fork and knife. Who don't know how to, you know, behave with the upper class. Who don't have the same money that we have. Who don't have the same family background. We have so many barriers. And those barriers are also in the church. Which is so sad because God has placed in the church a family. His family. And God said, I will place you in this family. But if you look at the church and say, well, you know, I am better than you. So I can't form an alliance with you. I can't have a relationship with you. Church, you will end up lonely. If you can break every barrier that we are that you have been born with every barrier you know that comes with the culture of this land church your loneliness will be a thing of the past why because we are trying to form relationships with people who are just like us forget it 
that's the world amen and in the world there's another thing you know you scratch my back i scratch your back i'll tell you why i'm telling you this because it 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 relates to something i'm going to say in the future and then we have all these friends we have our school friends we have our club friends we have our lions club friends we have our work friends and then we have our church friends different 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 types of friends but church you have to figure out who god has placed in your life amen hallelujah and so this jonathan and david their hearts were knitted together and in the very next scripture in 1 samuel 18:4 something very powerful takes place Jonathan strips himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David now in those days the robe that a person wore determined or, or represented his position in life a blind man would wear would, would wear a blind man's robe that's why blind bartimeus removed his robe and threw it on the ground uh, uh, saying i am no longer blind before he came to jesus and here uh, uh, Jonathan is wearing the robe of a prince he removes this robe and wraps it around David and says David you are the same level as me you are the same as me between us there is no difference this is the basic foundation of a relationship in Christ if you look at somebody who in you know social who's beneath you you become friends but you don't but you still see them as below you church that's not a covenant friend amen then david sorry jonathan takes his sword and he gives it to david you know what that means he's saying to david david now my enemies are your enemies your enemies are my enemies when trouble hits church you know who your friends are <laughs> are you hearing what i'm saying yes if i am ever in trouble i have told this to everybody don't come don't come preaching to me with a big fat bible amen come and just stand with me because in because when i'm in trouble i may be i may be wrong but i need your loyalty yes hallelujah i need your loyalty in the midst of of this great pain and possibly shame i don't want you asking me what i have done or what has gone wrong i just want you to come and stand by me yes hallelujah glory years ago when all all this you know i i i've been through my share of troubles but i was blessed with some covenant friends they're still with me and many times i would go to them and they know something they look at my face they know the dirt has hit the fan but they never ask me they never ask me what's wrong why because they can't solve my problems and i know it but all i want from them is their strength amen hallelujah Don't call somebody your friend unless you're willing to fight for them unless you're willing to suffer for them or sacrifice for them I have ministered to quite a lot of people in my time I I ministered to this one man he was big businessman something happened to him and he said to me he said brother David all the people who would flock to my house he said where are they they're nowhere Amen So you have to figure out who God has placed in your life take away this the lens that you that many people have of you know judging people's backgrounds and their social standings and their money and their education and even their language what an amazing huge barrier we have in our nation concerning language the english speaking people look down on all other <laughs> on the single tamil am i I'm telling the truth church we have huge 
language barriers where we look down upon people and my ministry is very much with a single Tamil and they feel oppressed they feel embarrassed that they can't even talk English we should be proud of it Amen if a Frenchman can't speak English he's not ashamed but here there's a shame there's a shame in not knowing English this is our culture but in the church we had to break loose of that culture in the name of Jesus now Jonathan and David their relationship did it take place over five years no it took place instantaneously Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. hallelujah their hearts were knitted together in one moment in Christ sometimes he say you know I can't trust him I've only known him for six months it's not time time doesn't matter because people I have known for 10 years have have put a knife in my back how about you time is, is, is actually not something that you have to use when judging friendships only God can bring friendships at the end of this meeting we are going to pray God will bring covenant friends into your life in the name of Jesus now David is taken into the streets of uh, Jerusalem and there's a big celebration because he had conquered Goliath and they were shouting Saul has killed thousands but David is killing tens of thousands and a great jealousy came upon King Saul and King Saul he was so jealous a spirit came up you see jealousy is a is an emotion but if it if it is neglected a spirit of jealousy comes and takes control of our our minds that spirit came and it was a murderous spirit he decided that he's going to kill David so strong so powerful was his jealousy why because it's fueled by a demon spirit and uh, you can you can read the story it's a beautiful story in in 1 Samuel chapter 18 um, so I won't go through all, all the, 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 the the entire story but you can you, you can read it at home and David begins to run um, in 1 Samuel 19 verses 1 to 3 and Saul spake to Jonathan's Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David <laughs> but Jonathan Saul's son delighted in David and Jonathan told David church this is treason Jonathan was Saul's son he learned the secrets of the palace the, st the, the plan to kill David and he slowly came out of the palace went and met David and said David my father the king is going to kill you you better run he risked his life he risked his inheritance my goodness wouldn't you like to have a friend like that amen not some backbiting slandering <laughs> hypocritical friend are you hearing what I'm saying on yes. church only God can give you these friends yes. but maybe you're looking in the wrong places if you haven't found them yet change the place you're looking for now David is running and he's feeling desperate he's feeling lonely he's feeling afraid church in this walk called faith there are seasons we go through where we feel desperate we even doubt our faith now I'm going to ask you this there are some people who, have, who even doubt the existence of God have you ever doubted the existence of God anybody in this house who have said is God real look at what I'm going through is he real I'm going to be the first one to raise my hand because when the pressure comes you even doubt God you doubt his existence and you say God why am I going through this <laughs> Amen 
I'll digress and tell you a story about John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus and he knew the whole story about the conception of Jesus because his aunt was Mary. Amen. And so the anointing of God comes upon John the Baptist and he's the one who begins to prophesy about the coming of Jesus. And then he's in the river Jordan baptizing people and suddenly Jesus turns up. And nobody knew who Jesus was. Nobody knew his spiritual significance. And God used John the Baptist to announce to the whole world and to, the, and to announce to the heavenly realm to the satanic kingdom included. Amen. So John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Only then that the satanic forces knew who this was. Now some years later, this John the Baptist who prophesied, who, whose cousin was Jesus, is put in a, a tiny cell, maybe four by four cell. He's a man who lived most of his life out in the desert. Now he's in a tiny cell and his mind began to play tricks. And then some disciples came. Or he sent some disciples, some of his disciples, he sent to Jesus with a very specific message. A message you won't believe that John the Baptist would send. Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? Amen. Can you see in this time of huge pressure, he began to doubt who God was. It happens. Now here is David in, in, a, in a kind of similar situation. And then David fled from Neoth to, Ram, to, to Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked. He asked Jonathan, what have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? He's an innocent man. Jonathan replied, Never! You are not going to die. Church, when you are going through pressures, words completely change you. Look, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? Then David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Jonathan says to David in verse 4, I tell you these words are worth more than all the gold and silver in the world. Jonathan said to David, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. Amen. That's verse 4. Can you imagine this church? Can you imagine in your time of great difficulty, your best friend comes and says to you, whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. I'll cut off my arm for you. Amen. Now David continued to run and hide. And then we come to 1 Samuel 23, verse 15 and 16. While David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, Jonathan learned, he learned that Saul had come to take his life. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh. Now here, he's hiding, okay? He's hiding in Horesh. David and Jonathan have not met for a long time. Jonathan is his ally inside the palace. And once again, Saul decides to take his life. David goes looking for Jonathan. Jonathan goes looking for David. And I love these words in, 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 in verse 15. And helps him find strength in God. Church, in my most difficult times, my friends could not solve my problems. But they helped me to find strength in God. That's what you, what you need to do. And do you know in this congregation, there are Davids and there are Jonathans. Amen. So this relationship, this great, beautiful friendship goes on. And in 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 2 to 4, the Philistines 
they came against the house of Saul and a great battle took place and Saul is killed together with Jonathan, Abinadab and another child. The whole family of Saul is killed. Amen. Hallelujah. Can you imagine? The whole family was killed. But, and one person in, uh, in the Israelite army was able to run, came to David and said, David, King Saul is dead. And so is Jonathan. In 2 Samuel chapter 126, look at what David says. No, so he tears his clothes and you know what? He weeps for, for Saul. Saul was the man who was trying to kill him. But he weeps for Saul and in verse 1, in verse 26 of 2 Samuel chapter 1, David says his most unlikely amazing words. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You are very dear to me. Now listen to this. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. Now, you know what this means? You see, in those days, kings, they had wives and concubines and anything that their flesh had pleasure in. But David said, Jonathan, my rela your relationship with me was at a higher level than the level of flesh. It fulfills something inside my soul that no woman could fulfill. Amen. This is covenant friendship. Are you happy this morning? Yes. God wants to give you friends. Now, I'm going to fast forward into the future. And now, David is on the throne. He is the king. I mean... The king of Israel was equal, equivalent to the king of, of uh, 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 the president of the U.S. He is the most powerful, richest king in all the world. I mean, this is not just a king of a small town. He is the greatest king of the earth and Israel was the most powerful nation in the world. Why? Because God, of God. So he fights battle after battle after battle and the whole world Comes to, uh, comes to know that, there is, that Israel has a great king that nobody can overcome. Nobody can go against king, uh, uh, king David and win. He is the greatest warrior, the greatest army chief, the greatest king uh, of that generation. So he is super successful. Amen. Now in the middle of his success, some years later, he suddenly gets a revelation. He suddenly gets a revelation. He says, is there anybody who is alive from the house of Saul? Because I want to show kindness to somebody. You know, this man, God said, there's nobody in the earth. I've never seen a man with, with a heart like David. So, Somebody says to David, everybody is dead, but you know what? There is one child who escaped and is in hiding. His name is Mephibosheth. Amen. So what happened was this. When the Philistines pressed hard against the house of King Saul, this servant took Mephibosheth, who was about two or three years old, and ran. While running, the servant fell and that little boy became a cripple. And he was living in, in hiding. David said, are you serious? You, you mean to say somebody of Saul's is still alive? Yes. Bring him to me. So they bring Mephibosheth into the palace. And he's trembling. He doesn't know what King Saul wants of him. And you know what his first words are? What do you want from a dead dog like me? He thought David wanted something from him. 
You know what Dean David said? He said, For all that your father was to me, for all that your grandfather was to me, I want to show you kindness. That's all. I'm not telling you the whole story, but there is a point where David and Jonathan meet out in the wilderness and they make an agreement. This friendship, they say to each other, is going to go down to the next generation. Amen. It's too long if I, if I tell you the whole story. Now that agreement is being invoked. So he says to Mephibosheth, I will return to you all the lands of your grandfather Saul. Everything that Saul ever owned, Jonathan ever owned, is coming back to you. And for the rest of your life, you will, you will sup at my table, the table of the king. Amen. Divine friendship, church. Divine friendship. It is what, it is kind of like the tonic of life. It's what keeps us going. You can't compare that to all the money in the world, to all the properties, to all the businesses. You know, in my, in my, in my job, in my profession, I meet a lot of wealthy people. And what I sense when I meet them is this, they are, they are very wealthy, they are very powerful, but they are lonely because they know everybody around them is there, but not sincerely. Amen. I like to close with this story. <coughs> there were two funerals. In one funeral, the wife had died and the husband was, he was crying. And he said, you know, she was the best wife. She was the best cook. She looked after my children. She did everything for me. And he's crying. There's another funeral. And in this funeral, the husband is crying, saying, she couldn't cook. She couldn't do much in the house. But she was my best friend. Church, marriages break. When friendship ends. Marriage is not a job. It's a friendship. Are you hearing what I'm saying church? This morning. If you're a married person. Who's watching. You're a married person here. I want you to renew your, your friendship. With your spouse. And say. You don't have to cook for me. You know there are, there are marriages. Where if the tea is cold, there is an explosion in the house. I'm serious. Do you know that there are mature Christians who behave like this? You got to stop because you will end up with a wife like a robot but with no soul. With no soul. When people come and say to me, you know, you know, brother, my wife doesn't cook for me what I like, I just say, why don't you order on Uber Eats? You know, <laughs> it might save your marriage. Amen. If your wife cooks, great, but if she doesn't cook, live with it. Don't break the friendship over a cup of tea. Church, there are people hearing this sermon, this message tonight, this morning, you're a Jonathan. I told you, people say, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Do you know when you read this story, David never did anything for Jonathan. Nothing. There was nothing that David could do for Jonathan. Jo it was a one-way stream of help. From Jonathan to David. This you scratch my back, I scratch yours is from the world. But in the kingdom of God, that's not how it works. What you do for somebody, somebody else will do for you. Amen. It might be a one way street. There is no give and take. There was no give and take between Jonathan and David. But 
when we go to heaven you know david he was one of the greatest men that that ever lived god raised him amen i mean there are things that that we can learn about him in the in the in the bible where after his death the things that he did uh, uh, that he's the one who when and open the 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 paradise right he led <laughs> let's not get into that the greatness of david was jonathan that was jonathan's reward for everything that he did for david your reward will come for being a friend to somebody so there are people in this congregation you have so much of love so much of resource so much to give you need to find a david <laughs> amen you need to ask god you need to say to god god send me david into my life that i can love that i can pour my resources on, upon them and if you are a david you got to say to god god take me to a jonathan bring me friends covenant friends who will be loyal to me in jesus name are we ready to pray church church is not a a congregation without relationships we are called to be one body one family Now you now I have loads of friends but I have an inner circle you must know who your inner circle is amen in my inner circle there are very few people Jesus also had inner circle he had 70 disciples of the 70 there were 12 out of the 12 there were three and then there was one John the beloved so he had his inner circle and he loved john more than anybody else so when he was on the cross john was the only disciple there apart from the two marys mary his mother and mary magdalene everybody else was gone so from the cross he looks at john and he says john look after my mother he looks at his mother and says mary john is your new son he look after you so he had his inner circle 